We? Have you got your Bibles with you? If you need a Bible, there's some Bibles over here that we can be handed out, etc. If anybody needs a Bible, raise your hand. Always good to have the Word of God uh, available to you. Amen. Amen. We're looking at Colossians, and it's Colossians um, 1 and 2. We, we're sort of still in. I'm, I'm probably just going to just do a little recap on, on the final part of Colossians. And, um, you know, as I've been studying this word, more and more keeps being added to it. That's the problem. The more you dig, the deeper you get. The more you dig, the more you see. And so we, we praise God for his goodness. We just Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for this time together. We pray, O oh God, that, Lord, by your spirit, you would just lead us and direct us, cause us, Lord, to hear your voice. Father, we pray to feel your presence. And Father, we want your word to touch our lives and, Lord, begin a real changing in us. We ask this for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And while I think on, it's just come to mind, uh, Hannah, um, who was with us last week, who dedicated, a, rededicated her life to the Lord. Um, couldn't be with us today. She's again. She's not. She's feeling unwell. No, she's having nosebleeds. So uh, let's just lift her right now before we we get into the word. And then Tracy sent a message saying that she's um, not good. She, they're messing about with these pills. You, when they start messing about with the pills, you, sometimes it throws you all over the place. You know. So we need to pray for Tracy as well. So. Uh, that God will just touch you. So let's just lift these two to the Lord before we go any further. Father, we just come before you and we just bring Hannah and the Lord, we bring Tracy. And Father, you know their bodies, you know how their bodies functions. The doctors are just guessing. But Father, you know. Lord, you formed us, you made us. We are so intricately made. But Lord, you are the one who designed us and made us. And Father, we just come to you right now and we lift Hannah and Tracy to you. And Father, we just ask that you would just touch them where they are. And that as, the, as we pray right now, they would feel your hand upon them. They would feel a touch of you just going into their bodies. We just ask this and we declare healing in the mighty name of Jesus. And we give you thanks and we give you praise. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wonderful Jesus. <clears throat> Praise his name. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> And uh, verse 23, we'll just start from there. If indeed you continue in, fa in the faith firmly, established and steadfast, and not be moved any way from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and for my flesh. I do not desire, sorry, I do not share on my behalf of his body, but which is the church in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made minister according to the stewardship of God bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been made manifest to his saints, to whom God willingly to make known what is the riches of his glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man 
with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose, I also labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Paul at work. Paul is preaching the gospel. Paul is declaring the word of God. And Paul, the, the church at Colossae, is on his heart. He's thinking about them. He's been praying for them. And he's praying and he's written this letter. Because as we said earlier, the church was being deceived by false doctrine. The church was being deceived by false traditions, rules and regulations. And Paul was, and the church was actually being diverted away from Christ being in the very center. And today, the church is still being diverted away from Christ being in the very center. Let's have a program. And in that program, you will find usually there's very rarely a mention of Jesus. Oh, let's do this situation. Let's change this. And you find very rarely is Jesus mentioned. But for the church to be real, for the church to be powerful, for the church to change lives, Jesus has to be the center and the focal point of all things. Healing comes from Christ. Through his death and resurrection, through his beatings, through his sacrifice on that cross, we receive our healings. Mick, you received that Bible through the fact that Jesus died and rose on a cross and he actually made you righteous so that God can say, you're my son and I've got a gift for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. You think, well, why should God do that for Mick? Will you stop preaching? Because he loves him. Now, you sometimes, you know, we, we tend to think, Does God really love me? Because if God really knew what I was like, he'd think, don't have what to do with that, Robert. I'll tell you. (laughs) But you see, God knows everything about him. God knows his weaknesses. Guess what? No, I don't know your weaknesses. God knows mine. God knows mine. He knows our weaknesses. He says he knows what we have need of. Yeah? I I remember when a family, some friends of ours, they had two boys. Obviously one's older than the other, they weren't twins. And uh, there's, I think, a couple of three years between them. And uh, when the little one was beginning to try and learn to talk, he would do something like this. He would go, nyum, 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 nyum. And mum and dad like, I haven't got a clue what he wants. But his big brother said, oh, he wants, and he understood what he wanted. You know? And this didn't happen just once. This was a constant thing that happened and for quite a while until he actually learned to speak properly. He would just go, oh, he wants so and so. Wow. And you know, sometimes we go, God. And God says, I know what you want, I know what you need. And sometimes we ask for things, and God says, That is not what you need. Have you ever asked for something and not got it? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I remember as a child, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. I remember standing standing in Wumwell looking in the the shop windows, you know, near the market. Do you remember where the little market was? Yes. Stood by this shop. It had a big shop with a big window and it had toys in it. You know? I remember, remember standing there thinking... Oh, I'd like that. And I said, Mum, I'd like that. And she just looked at me and said, we don't have enough money for that, love. 
Maybe later. Okay. I didn't go. <laughs> as they do today. Because one, it wouldn't have done any good. And I tell you what, there would have been something else that came along that brought me round from that. You know, I just knew that I knew that I knew. But I knew mum loved me. Yeah. I knew my dad loved me. But it's not just with things that God loves us. God wants you to draw close to him. You know, as, as most of you know, we have, have this dog. And um, it's, quite, quite a, it's, quite, it's quite an eye opener at times what he does. But, you know, if I go up to Grace and give Grace a cuddle, and we stand there having a cuddle, Guess what? The dog comes along, he runs up, and next thing he is on his hind legs. I, I, I need to be in this. He wants to be loved. Amen. And today, in today's society, people want to be loved. Yes. Is there anybody here that doesn't want to be loved? People want to be loved. Love is what makes things grow. Changes lives. Changes lives. When I fell in love with Grace and she fell in love with me, it changed my life. Has done for the last 50 odd years. Praise God. We have to realize that we have to persevere as we move forward in God. Because God wants to give you things. God wants to do things in your life that he's never done before. Because you weren't ready for them. God wants today to get his church ready for the revival to break out first in you. God wants revival in you. Do you remember when you first got saved? Yeah. Oh, you know, bring it on, you know. You were excited, weren't you? No? Yes. Oh, good, huh? Well, what happened? Come on. You didn't become all suddenly, oh, I, we've got to be acceptable and we've got to do things right, haven't we? Have we? God is looking for a people of power. Yes. And you only become powerful when you push the boat out with God. Faith only grows when you allow God to push your boat out. Yeah. Or when God says to you, get out the boat. As Jesus said to Peter. Come on, Peter. Yeah. Come. Come. Have you ever heard God say to you, Come. Did you step out? Yeah. I mean, can you, you know, there you go, 11 disciples in the boat. Peter's the fisherman. And they think they see Jesus walking on the water and they say, it's a ghost. And so they say, no, it's, it's Jesus. And he says, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Jesus says, come. On his very word, Peter gets one leg over the side of the boat and looks at the others and says, hey, are you coming? And they're all going, uh-oh. You do realize, Peter, what you're stepping into. Hmm? Yeah. You do realize that that is water. And the moment that you put your foot on it, you're going down. Yeah? But he steps onto the word of the Lord Jesus. That's what we step on. We step onto the word of God. 
And the word of God has substance. It carries us and takes us forward. And he stands on that word. And he walks towards Jesus on the water. Now most preachers that preach on this one always preach about, and Peter sank. You know, they love to nail him on the negative, don't they? You know, love to nail his failure. That's the world today, ain't it? Oh, do you remember me when you did this and you failed? You know, they love to, you know, they, they get hammering, like to hammer it in, don't they? Do you remember, Rob, when you did this and that, you didn't get it right? He's like, da, 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 da. oh, it's so love it, don't they? They make mincemeat of it. And then Peter steps out and he walks on the water. It's then he all of a sudden, he, do you know what he did? He took his eyes off the Lord. You know, this is today. The church has taken its eyes off Jesus. The church has taken its eyes off its power source. The church has taken its eyes off its deliverer. The church has taken its eyes off its healer. How many churches do you hear talk about come to Jesus, come and be healed in the name of Jesus, come and receive the healing of Jesus in your life? You'll hear the band strike up, You'll see the flashing lights and the smoke machines. Where's the manifest presence and power of Jesus? He took his eyes of Jesus. He's our life giver. He's our power source. He's the one who came to give us life and that more abundantly. And today, we need to fix our gaze back on Jesus. You know, Peter began to sink. And as he began to sink, what did he do? Called out to the Lord, and the Lord grabbed hold of him. Grabbed hold of him. And at that point, what you've got to remember, it says, and they walked back to the boat. He didn't sink, always going down a bit, but he fixed his gaze back on what was so important. He walked back to the boat. Can you imagine? All the others like, did you see that? Can you believe that? Who is this Jesus? That's their question. Today, we need to be having people ask us, who is this Jesus that you are talking about? Who is this Jesus that heals cancers? Who is this Jesus that opens blind eyes? Who is this Jesus that unstops deaf ears that you keep talking about? In Colossians verse 26, it says it's a mystery. He is a mystery. And this mystery has been hidden for thousands of years. And even today, it's hidden from the sight of every man and woman. And it is only revealed to those who are in Christ Jesus. It is a mystery. Salvation today is a mystery. How how is it you got saved? How is it that we continue on this journey of salvation and our relationship with him? Do you understand salvation? I gave my life to Christ. Did I understand it at that point, at that day when I gave my life to Christ? My answer is no. But I knew that I knew somehow inside of me that I needed to meet this man called Jesus. And I knew that this man Jesus had to come into my life. And I knew that this man Jesus would change my life. But how? I didn't understand. But I could took a step of faith when the preacher said, come. 
Is that what you did? Yeah. When the preacher said, come. You know, Billy Graham, he'd tell people, come on. Come. Give your lives to Christ. Come, surrender. He used to sing that hymn, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. And just as I am without one plea. And we just give our lives to Lord Jesus. Come. And today the voice of God is saying to the church, come back. Come. Come. Put me first. Put me in my rightful place. And allow me to be the Lord of your lives. You know, Jesus was asked by his disciples in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 6, and they said to Jesus, and the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak in parables? And Jesus answered and said to them, to you it has been granted to know the mystery, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them... Referring to the people gathered around him that didn't tr know Jesus. But to them, it has not been granted. We are a privileged people that know the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus wants you to hear his voice and wants you to understand the mystery of heaven. The mystery of the kingdom of heaven. Because God wants you to know his power and his blessing in your life. God wants to lift our spiritual blindness. God wants our spiritual eyes to be opened. Christ, he's the hope within us. He's our glory. He's our, he's our presence. Paul says in 28 and 29, and we proclaim him, Jesus. Admonish every man and teach every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. Perfect. Completely finished. As God intended 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden when God created man when God created Adam and Eve and they were made in the very image of God. I said on Wednesday night that when you look in Genesis it tells you there I think it's Genesis um, 111 talks about and God spoke to the earth and the earth brought forth of its kind. Yeah. He continues on and then he speaks to the water to bring of its kind and fish and all those things that swim in it and they live in that environment. And have you noticed that if you take a plant out of soil and put it on your kitchen side what happens to it? Why is that? Why did it die? Been taken out of its environment. If you take a fish out of the water and put it on your side what happens to it? It dies. It's out of its environment. But then when you, and then let's go back to Genesis. Then God spoke and said, let us, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. You know, if we stay connected to God, we live. We live spiritually. We live eternally. But the problem is today, man has turned away from God and said, I don't want anything to do with you. Man has pushed God away. 
And so when you take God out of the equation, when you take that which is the life giver of mankind, when you take that out, mankind dies spiritually. Dies and is lost. Christ is the hope of glory. Christ, that's our ultimate goal. That in, in Christ, that we are made perfect, that we are presented perfect in Christ Jesus. That word there in, in those few verses, last verse there, 29, when it talks about striving, that word is about Paul, he's agonizing for the churches. He's agonizing for the church. He's praying for you. Because he knows the challenges that we face. That word also means he's wrestling. He's contending for the faith. And you and I have to learn to contend for the faith. Because there's a prize as we contend for the faith. The prize of the upward calling in Christ Jesus. Yes, it takes some effort. Yes, it's a challenge. But I'll tell you what. I gave my life to Jesus when I was 16. Wow. Long time ago. Well, it's a few years anyway. See me after service. And you know something? I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change. I wouldn't. That decision, you know, if if you took me back all those years, back to the future, you know, (laughs) back to the future, I'd still make that same decision. Because do you know something? If I had not met Jesus at that crossroad, I would have not married my lovely wife. Because I would have never met her. Right? It's because of Jesus that I met my wife. And we've had 50 odd years of wonderful times together. But it's not about that only. It's the fact that he's been with me through every difficulty, through every challenge. And I I learned in, in my early years To learn to put Jesus first. And in putting Jesus first, I realized that everything else was added to me as I journeyed with him. I never missed out on anything by putting Jesus first. And I can never recommend Jesus too highly to anybody. It means that Christ should be the center of all things. We see actually in, um, in verse 18 of, of Colossians chapter 1, we just, I'm, I'm just going over, that he is the head of the body. The body is the church. He's you and me, that's you and I. And Christ is our head. Christ is the one who rules and reigns over us. He's the firstborn of all creation. His creative authority, it encompasses all spiritual things. It encompasses the spiritual universe. Angels were created by him. Planets were created by him. There's no reason to fear the demonic. Christ ruled and reigned and conquered all. And everything is being placed under his feet. In other words, that means under his authority. Jesus rules and reigns. Jesus Christ should be, first of all, preeminent in our own lives. 
And then if he's preeminent in our own lives at home, no matter where we are, no matter what we do, he will be then preeminent in the church. And we need to get excited. We need to realize that because of Christ being the very center of our lives, all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. I don't know where that came from. That's an old one, isn't it? But it's true. You, you know, I mean, that testimony, before you ask, before you call, I will answer. Do you not know God had already got that Bible plan for you? You see, God knows the very thoughts and the very intents of our hearts, it says in Scripture. Is that not right? He knows what you're thinking. It, it, God even knows what you are planning to do next week. And he laughs. God knows. And God thinks, well, I've got some other ideas lined up for you. You know? That you know nothing about. It can be an exciting ride following the Lord Jesus. And just let God deal with it. The Bible tells us to cast our care upon him. What that word cast means, it means actually the fishermen used to cast their nets. They didn't just go. <laughs> they took it. The word cast means to hurl. And they were with all of the strength and all the might. They would throw it out as far as they could. It had weights on it and everything and it began to sink and it would encompass the fish and they were trapped and then they would just draw it in. God knows what he's doing for you and for me. God is still on the throne. In chapter 2 of verse 1 it says this, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf. And for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. And verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul says, I'm in a conflict. I'm in a physical, I'm in a spiritual battle, and I'm battling for the saints. I'm battling for you, he says, to the church. He's like a wrestler. He's wrestling in prayer. He's pushing through. He's fighting. He's boxing. Yeah. The Word of God in Ephesians tells us, we studied a few weeks ago, tells that, that we are to stand. And when you've done everything, stand. Because God is in the battle. God is in the midst of all things. Paul in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 2 is encouraging the saints, stand together. Stand together in love for the faith and for one another. Stand together in love. Jesus gave us a, a, a commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Stand together in love. Stand by, stand by the side of one another in prayer and praise and rejoicing. Times of need when people need a touch from the Lord. Stand together. You know, God and his word are such a mystery. 
I don't think we really understand the mystery until God begins to reveal something that you've, you've read many times for years and then suddenly the word of God just pops open. It's like God just opens a, another dimension of his word to you and it's like, wow, never seen that before in that light and that mystery of understanding. Because you see, this word of God is, is written so that it's not written for the scholars to understand it because the scholars read it and say, there is no God. We've been to university. We lecture at university. We have read the Bible and we know there is no God. No, because you read it looking for him with your mind. And God is not a mind. God is spirit. And you seek and find God by your spirit. When God touched you, he awoken your spirit. And breathed life onto it. And quickened this mortal body. By his spirit. It is a mystery. How did I get saved? I've no idea. I put my hand up in a meeting. They said, come out to the front if you really mean that. And I walked out and they prayed for me. Something happened on that walking out. Amen. Something happened during that time of prayer. What was it? I really don't know. Do you know what happened to you? But you do know this, don't you? Something inside Changed. Amen. Isn't it? Look. Suddenly that, that burden of sin, that guilt, condemnation, and shame was just lifted. Because in Christ Jesus, the word tells us, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? There's no condemnation. You know the love of God. You know, when we read the word of God, we need to pray, Lord, as we read your word, open my eyes, my spiritual eyes of understanding. And as we open our eyes, God opens our eyes, we see in verse 3, we see the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is not about natural knowledge. This is not about natural wisdom. It's about a supernatural God revealing his mind to you. We need to ensure that we focus the church on the Lord Jesus Build the congregation's unity and understanding on Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Can we do that? Yes. Can we focus on him? Can we make him the very center? Not, well, I think differently to you. What does your spirit say? Let's meet God. Let's meet God, let's build together in the realm of the supernatural, in the realm of the spirit and be strong, learning to love one another as I have loved you. Let's build for the sake of the kingdom. Let's build because there are lives going to a lost eternity out there and they're looking for a place where love is the key. They're looking for a place where Jesus is glorified. They're looking for the supernatural. People today are looking to the supernatural. They're going to spiritualists and other places and, and they're going to Satanist covens and, and witches, white and black as they call themselves. But the answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is Jesus. He is the only way to God. It's not about Baptist, Methodist, Catholics, Church of England, Pres Presbyterian. It's not about that. It's not which church do you go to. No. Who is Lord of your life? Yeah. Is he first in your life? That is what it's about. 
And this is what Paul is saying. It's about Jesus. You see, what was going off in Colossians at that time was they were trying to put Jesus down. They were trying to make him less than what he was. And Paul is saying, no, it's a lie. It's from the pit. And if we lose the the realization of the power and the authority that is in and through the name of Jesus, then we might as well pack up and go home. We need to stand on this word. We need to stand on the promises of God and we need to let God move in our lives in a wonderful way. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you right now for your word. We thank you, Lord, for... Your word that you just speak to us and you just open it up to us, Father. We pray, Lord, that we as individuals and as a body together would understand the great mysteries of your word. We pray, Father, that you would open up to us great wisdom of revelation and great wisdom and knowledge of understanding in the supernatural. That, Lord, we might be there to touch and to change people's lives. Lord, we ask this, all your praise and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you today.